it turns out that there's these three different types of truth. <laughs> and most of the errors that we're making in being able to understand the world come from using the wrong type of, you know, truth lens on the truth that we're working with. Mm. And actually sticking with like the, 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 um, the person that kind of discovers that they're, they're, you know, their sexual identity or, you know, or, or discovers that they're queer, then you might, if you came up in a conservative family, they might be like, well, the social truth of our family is nobody's gay. And like mm. gay is just about being sinful and like you got seduced by the devil or something, mm. blah, blah, blah. Now they are trying to imp impose a social truth on something that is meant to be resolved at a personal level. Welcome to the Inspired Evolution. And we're back with Tom Chi, brother. Thank you so much for doing this with us again. Yeah, good to be here. For those tuning into Tom for the first time, we've done an episode previously with Tom. Please do go check it out. We covered things such as humanity, the economy, the environment, the future, all dedicated towards how to actually develop a future that is net positive to nature and humanity. It's an amazing conversation, even if I do say so myself. Tom, background in electrical engineering, he's turned into an inventor, an inventor, a leader, a coach, a speaker, an investor, a technologist. There is so much going on in this space. And uh, humbly, at the end of the last conversation we were having, um, just offline, we started unpacking a little bit, and Tom mentioned something about the three truths. And so I wanted to sort of just give you the floor, Tom, and sort of say, hey, what it does the three truths mean to you? What are the three truths? And let's unpack that a little bit and share that with the world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one quick addendum to the introduction is mm. I'm formally trained in physics and electrical engineering. So I, I was a working physicist for a number of years. And I only mention it because it's, it's relevant to today's conversation. Perfect. Thank you. I'll update, actually. I'll update that in my notes as well. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, what we talked about very briefly, and I think what you wanted to go cover today is, is we're in an environment right now where people are having a lot of difficulty trying to figure out what's true. Mm. You know, there is uh, many voices in the media, you know, many dissenting voices in the media and not just on trivial things like, oh, you know, who wore it best on the red carpet or what have you, <laughs> where it might make enough sense that people would have different opinions. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. On, on very consequential things. Yeah, uh, barely. You know, consequ yeah. Barely I'm consequential, sorry. sorry. I was going to say those things are barely consequential. And then you said, yeah, inconsequential things. Please, don't let me interrupt. Yeah, yeah, so, no, yeah so, so, you know, we are having major disagreements on, on, on very consequential things, mm -hmm. you know, about, well, how dangerous or real is a virus? How dangerous or real is climate change? How dangerous or real are you know whatever new technologies like 5g or what have you mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. um i realized that a couple different things have happened in the last couple decades which have made it a lot harder than it used to be mm -hmm. so obviously you know way back when you know and i don't even mean that long ago 20 30 years ago then there were way fewer channels there was a couple major news sources and you would you would actually get a lot of blowback if you know your journalistic standards you know, deviated substantially if you <clears> ended up reporting a bunch of things where the other three networks you know ended up you know their reporters found out that your facts were inaccurate or incomplete or you know a little bit too early <clears> and you know and actually people would kind of hold back sometimes to be like well i need to talk with more people on the ground our journalists need to do our work so that we can get the facts right you know, it's a developing story, but like we don't want to say too much about so and so. And a number of things have happened since those days. One is we moved to a 24 hour news cycle where it's not like a, a newspaper gets published, you know, once a day in the morning and people kind of like hold back and they try to get as many facts as they can in the day to go publish mm -hmm. out. It's as soon as they hear something, three seconds later, the tweet is live. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, five minutes later, like some kind of draft article is live. Mm -hmm. And, um, that does something pretty important around journalistic standards. Mm. The, the other thing that, uh, you know, because you just don't have enough time to check your work, um, and that's for the folks that are looking to practice journalism. But mm -hmm. the other thing that has changed is a, the media environment has been 
saturated with a number of folks that are kind of pseudo journalists, but really more entertainers. So they'll, they'll be like, well, if you come to my podcast, I talk about the hard facts. And it's like, well, really? Are you really meeting journalistic standards in your podcast? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know about that, actually. Like, you know, you did bring somebody on, on board to just say some things. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I don't want to critique that too much because I'm on podcast saying some things right now. So there's mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. but, but like when you really dig into that, then um, a lot of those folks are actually really more in the entertainment business than they are in the journalism business, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? If they mm -hmm. can say controversial things and get more people to, to click on them, um, then great. Yeah, let's in fact bring on board a bunch of controversial voices, mm -hmm. which is a different criteria than the journalists back in the day where it's like, well, who would be the most you know, best suited to be able to speak to this in, mm -hmm. in an intelligent, nuanced manner. Well, that's a very different thought process than, oh, you know who really makes people mad? Or, oh, you mm -hmm. know who's really getting a big following? And it's like, no, those mm -hmm. are just different criteria. I'm not saying that there isn't some merit to, you know. Yeah, so we're, right? we're poking at the subtlety between actually the, like having a subject matter expert that's previously gone away and had to do all the work in terms of evaluating multiple opinions and f sorting out fact from fiction themselves versus who has the loudest opinion in a space. Yeah, and, and controversy absolutely does help you build an audience. It absolutely mm -hmm. does get the ratings. It helps you make money. So to the extent that, you know, um, a lot of these media outlets have really focused on financial survival then, uh, or sometimes, you know, like it, for the in the case of a two hundred million dollar podcast, like way more than financial survival, <laughs> but like you know, like to the extent that they are moving more into the monetary consideration than they yeah. are into the journalistic consideration, because Pul mm -hmm. Pulitzer Prize winning journalists are also not really wealthy people, yeah. right? For the most part, maybe they end up getting a best selling book and now they're you know now they've made a million dollars, but these uh, tend not to be billionaires. These tend not to be particularly wealthy people. They have dedicated themselves to journalistic integrity, which is <laughs> happens not to be the the best from the business standpoint, but man, like we really miss it as a society right now. So journalism has obviously experienced a bunch of erosion. And then the other important erosion from a lot of people sort of thing and uh so you know and they tried to make themselves sound better by calling themselves creation scientists because they heard well science if you do science then that's more legitimate so we'll call ourselves creation scientists and and that will go and become an alternative theory that we actually just like better of course these people didn't practice science in any any sense of the word and you know little by little those sorts of forces have been Kind of chipping away at you know society's fluency and and ability to make sense of scientific fact mm. so um so anyhow this is this is all kind of a prelude to really the most important framework that i want to share today mm -hmm. which is we have a, a simple word called truth but really there's actually three types of truth mm -hmm. and the the first type is scientific physical truth Yep. And the way to go understand this type of truth is it would actually be true even if there weren't people around, mm. right? And, and this is why I mentioned it's like, oh, that, that I am a, a physicist and formally trained in physics. Mm. Gravity exists in the universe whether there's people or not, <laughs> right? Like yeah. the, the solar system formed and that required gravity and that was before the earth formed. We can look at how galaxies spin. We can see gravity doing its thing. You know, we can look back, you know, billions of years in time through our telescopes and basically mm -hmm. see gravity just doing its thing, mm -hmm. which I think it would then be pretty fair to say that like, yeah, gravity has been working the way that it works well before there were people. And mm -hmm. honestly, you know, if, if humanity doesn't last, you know, another hundred million years, then it's going to keep on going after we've done our thing. 
Yeah. And scientific truths, for the most part, yeah, they basically work whether people are there or not. Mm -hmm. This you know? is that um, I'm, what's resonating for me is that, you know, the ancient sort of proverb is like, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's around to hear it, does it make a sound? And it's like, actually, if the tree falls in the forest, energy is dissipated. <laughs> whether there's mm -hmm. someone to interpret into a sound is a whole other thing, but the physical like truth of like, yes, energy is dissipated. Um, yeah, the reason that that's a Zen cone is it's really just the question of, is sound a observer phenomenon or is sound the phenomenon of mm -hmm. the thing itself? Because yeah. definitely like the air vibrated in a way that an ear mm -hmm. could receive. But mm -hmm. if you basically say, well, it's not a sound until I hear it, yeah. then no, it doesn't make a sound. Mm -hmm. But if, if you're saying, well, sound is basically just the vibration of air then absolutely mm, absolutely yeah so so anyway there is a first type of truth which is physical truth and it works whether there's people around or not mm -hmm. and and you know this is actually notable relative to the pandemic as well it's like did viruses exist before people evolved absolutely <laughs> we have a very long history we can look in the fossil <clears throat> record at the evidence of viruses we can date some of our viruses you know, way back, you know, actually to time periods before humans evolved. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it's like, yes, you know, the basic construct of a virus uh, existed long before humans, it'll exist long after humans. Because even if we don't like a couple of the viruses, and we wipe them out, then we won't wipe out all the viruses on the planet. It's just part mm -hmm. of, you know, how, um, how biology on this planet works. So it's like, yes, the, 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 you know, the science of being able to go study viruses, is the study of something that would actually still be running even without humans being around. Now, the, the study of a specific virus and its function in a human body, then yes, you know, you do need to, you know, uh, kind of focus in on that. And that's where, you know, it gets a little bit interesting because uh, if you use, well, if the humans weren't around type criteria, well, this particular virus infects a human body. But what, what I will say is that, um, you know, even if that human body did not have you know, uh, a lot of consciousness going on, would it have the same function or not? So if somebody got infected by, um, by COVID who was in a coma, and let's say, you know, according to all our scans or whatever, there basically isn't very much brain function, then no, the virus would still do its thing. It actually has nothing to do with the, what that person thinks about it. So as much as, you know, that's kind of on the barrier, because there is a human involved when people are getting, you know, infected by a virus mm -hmm. that that affects humans, then yeah, no, even a completely unconscious human would be infected by this virus. So it is a kind of mechanical thing. And this first type of truth, I, I'm going into some detail on this because this first type of truth is the type of truth that is best evaluated through science, mm -hmm. right? Because science is very good at trying to take an objective lens of things. Mm -hmm. It's very good at you know improving its understanding by being able to look at many different iterations of a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, and science works best in situations that are highly repeatable. Repeatable. So when it comes to gravity, if you drop an apple, it takes a certain amount of time to fall. If, you know, 10 million people drop that apple the same distance, just takes the same amount of time to fall. Mm -hmm. But like, it, you know, you can repeat that literally 10 million times and the laws of gravitation will, will work fine. One thing that has been challenging about COVID is that it is a virus that has been mutating. Mm. So like science is, of course, like studying as much as it can about the initial variant and then the alpha variant and then the delta variant and then the Omicron variant and all that sort of thing. But no, the, the specific, you know, things that the virus is doing is a little bit different each time. Mm. But, you know, on each variant, then you can do repeatable studies on, on, you know, what that specific variant or kind of that family of variants is doing. So anyway, that's the first type of truth. Mm. Yeah, and that's like scientific physical truth. The grounded hard physical reality facts. Yeah. Right. And and stuff that basically is just gonna work that way no matter what somebody on TV says mm. or how big their following is. Or yeah. it's like, but if you think about it this way, it's like <laughs> the person in the coma could think about it a million different ways or not think yeah. about it at all, and they will also still get infected. So yeah. It so it does not matter. Not subject to yeah, not subject to perspective or opinion. Yeah. Okay. Right. Per perspective, opinion, persuasion. These are actually not useful ways to go work with mm. that that set of facts. So second type of truth is what I call social truth. Mm. So like like an example of a social truth is you know Madonna is a huge pop star, or you know I guess. 
who are the Madonnas of today? You know, I guess Lady Gaga for a bit, Dua Lipa now, whatever. Like mm-hmm. whoever is a great, a great pop star, mm-hmm. right? Well, you say, well, great. Like that clearly could not be a fact if people weren't around, <laughs> right? Like a billion years ago, you can't be like, okay, Madonna's a great pop star. What does that even mean? <laughs> There's no people around. What is a pop star? Right? Yeah, Madonna's not even born yet. Yep, 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 yep. But, well, and yep. actually, even a billion years from now, like let's say there are no people a billion years from now, that would once again be a completely, mm-hmm. you know, what is that statement even? Right? Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. And social truths are related to what the majority of society believes. Mm. Right. Mm. So, so, um, cause like, you know, could society have like ended up not liking Madonna's music and, and a different person is the pop star? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. You know, in fact, like who was the Madonna of 1850? Probably not many people have an answer to that. So mm. clearly like, you know, because the people that were listening to music, though there wasn't recorded music then, but the people that were in the circles where they could listen to, you know, people play live mm-hmm. had probably a favorite back in 1850. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. we don't remember it anymore. So that social truth has kind of evolved. It's moved on. Mm-hmm. It is related to the, you know, kind of the totality of uh, the sentiment of a lot of people kind of thinking about a thing mm-hmm. and uh, kind of feeling a certain way about it. Now, actually the mechanism to be able to go discern you know what is happening on in uh, happening in the social truth is journalism right Mm. because what you do is you basically go talk to human beings and if you know best thing is to go talk to the people that are directly affected called primary sources you know that 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 were literally at the event that literally saw the Mm. thing and and you know whatever like the the Beatles had their first couple concerts in the U.S. and journalists came out and they talked to fans. It's like, what was that like for you? And then, mm. boom, all these primary sources. And that is actually how they started to get like, oh, it's the British invasion. Like, like they, you know, the, all these, you know, uh, British pop stars are making a huge difference in, in the U.S. That was basically a developing social truth that was kind of tracked through journalism. And you, you can kind of see where I'm getting at with these things, right? Like mm-hmm. in the in the intro, I was like, yeah, kind of science has been under attack, journalism has been under attack, which means we've been attacking like the, the way for us to figure out the first type of truth. Mm-hmm. We've also been attacking and eroding the way that we figure out the second kind of truth, mm-hmm. right? Because it's like, um, you know, you, you, you bring up some, some modern discussions that where there's battles on the second type of truth. Well, is critical race theory poisoning the minds of our children and ruining everything in the world? Or is it, is that super overblown and actually critical race theory is a, um, is a, is kind of a legal philosophy that helps us go look at systemic problems and helps us try to build a more equal society, right? Mm -hmm. Those Mm -hmm. are two perspectives on critical race theory and good journalists would basically go out there and try to get a feel from like, well, what's actually happening? Mm -hmm. Let's go interview some kids. Are, you know, are they getting brainwashed? No, it actually seems like no, right? Mm. Oh, let's go interview some folks that are critical race, you know, theorists, like legal scholars, Mm. you know, how do they see this stuff playing out? Let's go, you know, like, let's go uh, interview some parents and some PTA members, right? So, Mm -hmm. so that's not what we're doing though, right? Uh, Like what is actually happening is that particular concept has become highly politicized. Mm. And there's a set of people that will say like, this is the end of civilization. Right. And th- they're literally couching it in those terms. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, you maybe look at that and it's like, ah, I don't know. That seems a little overblown. But though, honestly, uh, like, I don't know. We should just apply journalism to it. I don't even mm-hmm. want to go and, you know, weigh in too hard on, oh, that's totally overblown. Let's just mm-hmm. do some good journalism and see what's actually true about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right now, we aren't really doing that much of it. Anyhow, I, I before we dig too much into any specific uh, you know, um, kind of, of controversy truth. of today, then yep. let's actually hit the third type of truth. And the third type of truth is personal truth. Mm. And personal truth are things where, you know, maybe to you, you know, Madonna's not that great a pop star. You are just, you, you're a huge fan of big band jazz and like <laughs> the best musician ever, you know, Duke Ellington's your guy, <laughs> Yeah. right? But that's fantastic. That's a personal truth, right? You, mm. You're completely entitled to that personal truth. And that's obviously a very kind of trivial one. Mm-hmm. But, you know, on mm-hmm. um, uh, like another one that oftentimes comes up is, um, you know, if you are 
it, you know, if you grow up in a relatively conservative family, but then you end up, you know, finding out that you are a queer person mm -hmm. where it's like, oh, well, now that I'm old enough to be attracted to people, I'm not attracted to the people that my, my parents wanted me to be attracted to. Well, that's a personal truth. That is something mm -hmm. that is going to be, you know, true for you that the main person to go check with is you. Hmm. You, you can't basically go and, you know, uh, read some journalistic account of 10, what 10,000 other people said hmm. and have that like define your personal truth. And you can't just read in some science journal where it's like, oh, you sitting on the couch right now, you know, this is true for you. So it turns out that there's these three different types of truth. Mm -hmm. And most of the errors that we're making in being able to understand the world come from using the wrong type of, you know, truth lens on the truth that we're working with mm -hmm. and actually sticking with like the, 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 um, the person that kind of discovers that they're, they you know, their sexual identity or, you know, or, or discovers that they're queer, then you might, if you came up in a conservative family, they might be like, well, the social truth of our family is nobody's gay. And like, mm. gay is just about being sinful and like you got seduced by the devil or something, mm. blah, blah, blah. Now they are trying to imp impose a social truth on something that is meant to be resolved at a personal level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You would also feel really bad if, if you, you were the person who loved Duke Ellington. And it's like, sorry, this is a family that only likes Madonna. And it's like, well, I don't know. I feel kind yeah. of <laughs> left out then. Why is everybody like this? Yeah. But, but those are examples where when you start to try to use the wrong, uh, you know, way of resolving truth mm. to something that is not meant to be resolved that way in that category, mm. then you're just going to live through a lot of frustration and confusion. Well, not just frustration and confusion. In some instances, you can even see with family rifts and stuff like some of that stuff actually causes trauma. So yeah, it actually can be quite sinister. Um, oh, it, the, it can be quite dangerous. Uh, yes. And, and the longer that you are exposed to that, then it can be, become even more problematic. Like, like obviously, when I see a lot of talk about, uh, about climate change, mm. basically what has happened is there's a group of people that want to argue about it like it's a social truth mm. where they basically say well hey you know well, like well in our political party we believe that and i was mm. like well guys this is like this is physics it's you not know? up and, to belief systems <laughs> yeah and, and if you look at other planets like you know mars doesn't have enough greenhouse gases and venus has too many mm. and and like you know on venus like metal like melts just mm -hmm. in the atmosphere like it's that hot and on mars it's like i don't know you, you don't have enough uh atmosphere to rub two sticks together really mm. but um well whatever that's not a good analogy because there's no sticks on mars but, but you get it <laughs> but like but the, the whole point here is like we can see what a greenhouse gas effect does mm. and like we don't have people on mars we don't have people on venus this doesn't have to do with somebody's opinion Mm. Right. We know that greenhouse gases absolutely change the temperature of a planet in a very substantial way, all the way from melting lead on the surface, all the way to it's freezing cold, even in the summer. Mm. And, um, and yeah, there's that, like that much of it is just a straightforward scientific fact. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason that we're in this weird conundrum about it is people that don't want to, uh, they, they might have business interest in fossil fuel industries, or they might, you know, just have become politically aligned because of, you know, historical rhetoric, you know, uh, from, from somebody they voted for before or a party they voted for before, where they want to say like, oh, no, no, this is really effectively about opinions, right? Hmm. Right. This is really a social truth, right? Mm -hmm. And if we can get enough people like, you know, to, to agree with us on this social truth, then climate change is not real I was mm. like, guys you're definitely using you know category two resolution on a category one problem mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. sorry mm -hmm. like the physics of this just works a certain way and, and and in fact the fact that you're not talking to me in the language of physics means that no like probably what you're saying doesn't make any sense mm. and this is actually what one should be listening for like when somebody's trying to go talk to you about a category one truth Mm -hmm. And you should hear some things that are about like the language of, of data and science and, and, you know, studies that are statistical significant and studies that have been peer reviewed by multiple scientists. And this is not to say that, 
over time, scientists can't learn more and our understanding can't evolve and, and improve, but it is always based off of well-defined studies and with, with study methodologies and supporting data and all sort of thing. And somebody that is trying to go resolve something in category one, if they are not talking like that, or they're at least not referencing people that are talking like that, then they may be using the wrong tool for a mm. category one sort of situation. Tom, is um, is any of the truths, I need better languaging um, around this, but is any of the truths better than any of the others? Or is it just a matter of keeping things within context relative to what your context? Yeah, applying the right truth in the, given the right context. The, no, there, none is better than the others. It's just mm -hmm. you have to use the right one. Mm -hmm. but like, you know, um, but, well, if you use the wrong one, then that's definitely worse. It's catastrophic, you, right? Like if we start believing that yeah. climate change is like a social truth when actually it is a hard fact or like a like a like a hard truth, right? And a category well, one. Well, the truth physics of atmosphere is absolutely <laughs> a hard fact. So this is this is shown very much between the other planets, and it's also yeah. shown in the way that our own planet's atmosphere has evolved over the last hundred years. It's mm. it's pretty straightforward. This one requires a thermometer. It's not a particularly mm. hard it's not like some deep calculation. So it can be quite catastrophic when we're applying the wrong context, like the wrong uh, category of truth in the wrong context. When we're trying to when we're trying to apply the wrong way of resolving a truth, mm. you know, uh, like we're we're trying to apply a way of resolving that truth that comes from the another category. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And look, it can be catastrophic at the family level too. It's like a, a queer person who gets traumatized by their conservative family. It's like, oh, they might commit suicide. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, that's a pretty catastrophic outcome for something mm -hmm. that was a personal truth and something that people honestly just knew about themselves and their mm -hmm. family, you know, just had no room to accept it. Yeah, touch wood. So I guess the question that um, comes out of this space is how to discern between the three truths and how to discern when to apply which particular, um, because yeah, um, there will be potentially some people listening in that may still have the opinion that climate climate change is something like climate change, if we just continue to run with that example, is something that is a scientist's opinion. Um, how do you know what to apply in what, and I disagree with that personally, but that's my own personal truth, um, leaning into a uh, leaning into a, yeah, a hard truth. Um, but yeah, I think how do we discern between what what context we're in and which truth category to apply and to adhere to given any situation. Cause I think therein lies the real, the real art, the real tact, because yeah, just to sort of lead in a little bit of my own experience. I remember I went deeply down a conspiracy theory rabbit hole um, and it started um, way back when, when I started getting curious about the origins of money and, you know, there are people literally, you mentioned suicide and, you know, there are people literally taking their lives due to debt that they, you know, have in their life. And it's like, what is this modicum of, you know, financial exchange, energetic exchange that we have in our society um, that actually people take their lives over? And it's like, well, it's just money. And it's like, yeah, but where does the circulation of money commence from? And then started unpacking that and financial institutions and who runs them. And, you know, from there, it was like all these other conspiracy theories started to flood in. And I was, I thought I was on the journey of seeking out more and more truth, but it was so you know, convoluted at a certain point, you know, and at the risk of, yeah, like I don't even want to sort of share some of the stuff that was sort of coming out, but, you know, it goes as far as, you know, are human beings even, you know, run by other human beings or are our leaders reptilian overlords? And it's like, that makes no sense, but you can see how far down the rabbit hole you end up. And one of the things that I had to do to sort of iron out and cleanse all of that out of my system, out of my thinking was literally coming back to my own personal truth. And I love the model you've set up because, it was six months of going way down the rabbit hole, getting completely lost in what is true, what is not, just in the pursuit of truth to realize, okay, my truth came back to, and it ended up actually quite spiritual. It was, what is my relationship with the earth, the food that I eat? What is my relationship with the water that I drink? Is it nice, crystalline, clear, pure? What is the relationship with the sun, fire? Yeah, like, am I getting good sunshine? Am I eating good food? And what is the relationship with the air that I breathe? You know, am I breathing good, clean air? You know, and I literally had to distill it back to like core fundamental personal truth and just focus on that to have to sort of, 
you know, surrender all the neuroses that were coming in from all the explorations that was potentially true, potentially not true, a whole bunch of social truth for different pockets of social society stratum as well. So, yeah, I think all of that to sort of say, how do we discern, you know, for me, I had to sort of go down like this real, I had to go down the journey of getting all mixed up and convoluted and blah, 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 and then have to go, okay, what is actually true? Um, for me and that was like kind of you know going all the way deep into the shadow to sort of find the light of my own truth if you will put it that way um but is there other ways that we can actually discern truth um between the different three three different categories of truth yeah no th thank you for for sharing that personal story and look it, it um that sort of thing can happen to many a folk it's it's not the sort of thing where it's like oh well you were particularly you know misguided or or, you know, you, like you don't have the smarts to go chase down the actual truth, that sort of thing. But what, what I will say is when the, when every new layer just creates more complexity mm. than where, where, like you said, so yourself, it started to get pretty darn convoluted. Mm. It's like, well, if that's true, then wouldn't this even crazier thing need to be true? Mm. And it's like, hmm, well, that's at least a, a, a indication that we might be going down a direction where uh, if the more complicated thing is true, well, now you have an even harder job of, uh, for yourself to be able to go sort through all the details there. But like if the, you know, another explanation when things seem to get more and more convoluted is um, sometimes people will make more and more convoluted uh, explanations because they effectively need to believe a thing to be true. So they will keep on changing the explanation in, in order for it to stay true. Mm. Oh, you know, oh, I thought, um, you know, like Robert, you know, F Ken uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. was going to come back from the grave to go and show up at my QAnon rally. It's like, that's getting pretty convoluted. And it's like, well, mm -hmm. how come he didn't show up? Well, because he was at a concert. I was like, the, what are we talking about now? <laughs> Well, we're getting into some things that sound just a little bit um, far-fetched. Yeah, pretty far-fetched. Now, because now, typically what happens when you start to resolve things toward uh, truth using the right resolving vector is actually things get simpler and make more sense over time. Mm, can you just repeat that? Because <laughs> that is like, that's a nugget right there. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. If you are using the right resolving approach, then typically things will get simpler and clearer over time not more complicated mm. right right Which look is, if you if you sorry. know nothing about you know the function of viruses then it might sound a little complicated for the first you know two hours where you kind of dig into it a little bit mm. but then once you get into it you're like oh yes okay i get it this is this type of virus oh yes then this data that is coming back from these agencies does make a decent amount of sense mm -hmm. oh shoot okay well Oh, and if you go to next strain and then you go look at the different variants and that sort of thing, and you can see all the people that have published papers and you can literally look at the DNA sequences that are associated with them. Oh, this is making more sense now. Oh, mm -hmm. and then here are the sequences that are, are the ones that, you know, help to go define Omicron. Okay, mm -hmm. I get it. I get how this would go and change the function of this thing in the virus. So but like, like whatever, they might be like a little bit of moment where it's getting more complex because you're going from no knowledge about it to some knowledge about it. Mm -hmm. But then you get over the hump and then things actually pretty much get clearer and clearer over time. Mm -hmm. where you're like, oh, yes, now I know how that functions. Or, uh, And look, if you aren't a scientific mind or you don't have that kind of training, it's okay. Like go and hang out with some people that mm -hmm. like have that background and and this is the other thing. It's like not every scientist is going to agree, but to the extent that they disagree, then they should be coming with interesting data. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there is a thing called the scientific consensus. And what that really refers to is given that, because the nature of science is that it's not a monolithic entity. It's not controlled by government so that every scientist agrees the same with the, with the same thing. In fact, in science, you're actually are, are incentivized to, to explore different perspectives. Mm -hmm. Because if you were to go publish a paper that like literally had nothing new in it, it, it wouldn't get published actually, mm -hmm. right? Or I, I mean, you can still publish the occasional paper, which is a confirmation of a previous scientific finding. But mm -hmm. if you wanted to make a name for yourself in, in academics, then 
you generally wouldn't. So the whole idea that there's a conspiracy of scientists where we force them all to agree, it's like, that would be like, not that professionally wouldn't make any mm, sense. Mm. But like, like what, what's the benefit? Uh, like, why would a bunch of scientists choose to publish completely not novel results? That doesn't make any sense. Mm. So, so, so like, number one, scientists are not some cabal that are all unified that are and forced to agree with each other. In fact, like we are curious people that generally like to see if there's some other interesting thing around the corner or another mm. way to go look at the data that we currently have in front of us. But when the scientific consensus, you know, starts to converge on a thing, because part of the way that we, we got into consensus on climate is scientists that weren't even studying climate started to get, you know, interesting climate like results. Mm. So for example, like there'd be biologists like studying you know, a rodent population on a, on a remote island. And they would be mm. like, oh, rising sea level, you know, has basically completely eliminated their habitat. I'm mm -hmm. not even trying to be a, a climate scientist, but clearly something happened with the sea levels out here because we mm. studied them for 15 years and now all their habitat's gone. Whoops. Yeah. So, so like those people weren't even trying to be climate scientists. Mm. They, these were people that were just trying to be rodent biologists or something. And they're like, hey, by the way, and then, you know, people that like do geology and mining, they start, it's like that yeah, permafrost is all shaky these days. What's up with that? They're not even trying to be climate science. Heck, they might be trying to extract oil out the ground, mm. but like, but like, you know, they are effectively getting data, which is supporting this larger idea. Mm -hmm. uh, so, mm -hmm. And like, yeah, those people would definitely not be paid off to go and and say that you know climate change is real. They work for oil companies, mm. right? Like they should be paid off to be you know if anything they should be incentivized to be publishing the opposite. But mm. like absolutely, people that are kind of doing this uh, this like you know geologic uh, prospecting for oil and gas are basically seeing these things in the nor northern climates, even though mm -hmm. it would be kind of a, against their company's interests. Mm -hmm. It's just what their papers say. That's just mm -hmm. what the data says. Yeah. So, so it's like. You should know, number one, that scientists are not just some unified cabal. We, we tend to pride ourselves on being independent thinkers. I, I was a peer reviewer. So like mm. I read other people's papers and, and rejected many a paper where it's like, oh, the methodology doesn't sound, you know, seem sound. Your conclusions seem like too much of a leap relative to the data that are there. And um, so number one, it's not some unified cabal. Number mm. two, most of the people that are, are seeking truth honestly don't make very much money off of it. Mm. Like, like I said, the Pulitzer Prize winning journalists, oftentimes they just have pretty regular salaries. They make 80K a year doing journalism. Mm. You know, the, the, the lab scientist that is like collecting the data or the biologist that went out to go study that rodent population, they probably don't even make 80K a year. Mm -hmm. But it actually is an interesting indication as well. Like if somebody's making big dollars off of speaking and like, being an anti-vax, you know, um, like scientist mm. that gets to speak at all the conferences and mm. they literally have grossed $6 million in the last year from it. It's like, hmm. Is there another agenda there? <laughs> yeah, maybe, yes. Like, and look, like as a scientist, even then, like I would just still want to see the data. Mm. Is there a world where like you make $6 million a year off of your speaking fees and also you're working off of really good data? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. still possible. Mm -hmm. But like as a scientist, show me that. Mm -hmm. Right. But like a lot of times when I, I see that the, you know, the folks in the conspiracy world or the folks that are that kind of like advance these theories that are very far out of the scientific consensus and making bank doing it, mm. then like they, they wouldn't pass muster in a peer reviewed situation. Yeah. So this plays into one of the questions um, I jotted down and I wanted to unpack is. Tom, what about the human condition, in your opinion, um, enables, uh, and again, we're, we're discussing some really deep things, so pardon me for trying to find the words correctly, but hopefully you will grant me the grace to sort of just ask it the way that I can and then we can actually unpack it further. But let's take that instance. What about the, the social condition of, you know, how we operate in the world? Why is it that a social truth and an opinion on a subject could actually gross 
uh, let's just say, speaking engagements of up to $6 million of the world, right? Whereas the cold, hard facts may not be as shiny, as illustrious. What about, and the words that are sort of in my mind around this question are ego, vigilance, complexity, fear, you know, the, the dance about these, the, between these sort of things and the mind and how it hooks into like information, the way that, it, you know, it goes, oh, that actually seems like, you know, oh, the, you know, the vaccine is a conspiracy. Let's look at like, or, you know, the, the virus is a conspiracy or something like that. Why do topics like that, when they're clickbaity potentially, do they get so much more airtime? Do they just like, what is it about the human condition that sort of spurs out into like wanting to just rab it down into that, in a rabbit hole buried down into that with such um, intensity, potentially even, rather than just something that is a simple, cold, hard fact. I think you actually pointed it out already, which is if people can wrap it in some real scary narrative mm. and, and like, you know, like capture people with the scariness of it mm. and, then, and then elevate themselves to be like, only I know the truth. So you must follow me and pay me the money to be able to keep telling you the truth. Mm. Then that's a, honestly a very easy formula to make money. Mm. And the thing about scientists, and I, I don't want to be hard on us because I'm a scientist too, but, but it's like, honestly, a, a lot of the things that we share just sound uh, really boring. Yeah. <laughs> like they don't sound like, oh my gosh, you know, let me tell you about this insane conspiracy. And like, once you get to it, you're going to be gripped on the edge of your seat. In fact, I'm going to need to keep you awake as we get to like the third graph. And I'm going to be like, okay, well, if you look at the regression that we're doing on so-and-so and you think about sun, the chi square is saying this, but actually you could also use this statistical method. You, I mean, even if we're talking about something pretty scary, you'd be like, oh God, it's real boring. Like, well, well, honestly, this is what it takes to be methodologically accurate. Yeah. Now, at the end of the day, there are people that are good science communicators. Yeah. And they will go and take methodologically accurate, well-collected data, well-interpreted data, and they'll mm. try to explain it. So they'll be like, okay, imagine the analogy, like this mm. is kind of a cork on a bottle, or imagine the analogy that, mm. you know, like, you know, global warming is kind of like, you know, being under uh, too many blankets in the winter, mm. and now you're too hot, right? Like mm -hmm. the heat can't escape from your body to the air. The, then like, yeah, sure, there are science communicators that might be able to, to do a better or worse job of being able to interpret the well done quality methodological, you know, like a methodological approach kind of studies and communicate them to the larger audience. But even those folks typically mm. don't, it doesn't sound scary in the same way that a conspiracy sounds, doesn't mm. sound gripping the way that, because this is why I was saying at, at the beginning, it's like, a lot of what's happening is everything is becoming entertainment. Mm. And it's like entertainment should be gripping. If mm -hmm. I like turn on a TV series and it's like pretty darn boring and they're going to mm. go and run me through a, a statistical analysis in minute three, mm -hmm. then it'd be like, yeah, maybe you should change the channel. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, and honestly, if you want to go watch a great TV program, then there's nothing wrong with having the skill of, you know, being able to make something gripping, like being effectively a good writer, mm -hmm. you know, or like a, you know, a good propagandist can also like really stoke the fears or stoke the, you know, the, the ambitions or imaginations of people all that sort of thing. But I'm just going to tell you that that's not really the bread and butter of, of what scientists communicate. Mm. The bread yeah. and butter of what scientists communicate is this was the design of the study. Here's the data from that study. And here's, you know, our interpretation of that data. And, you know, and there, there tends to, in papers, there tends to be a discussion section where they even talk about like, Yes, we recognize that there might be these two other ways to interpret the data. And in the discussion, we explain like why we publish this one out of the three ways that you might interpret the data. Tom, Which, by the way, none of that sounds like the people that advance the conspiracy theories. Mm, Most of them mm. are like, I, I alone know the one true fact. And it's yeah. like, scientists don't do that. Read the discussion section. They will literally say like, okay, I know that I approach this in a stochastic way. One could also basically create an analytical model at the core. And if you just did uh, permutations on the analytical model, that might also lead to interesting model outcomes. That's literally what a scientist sounds like mm. when they're talking about even the things that they've studied quite well. 
because there is uh, some part of me in this conversation now that is like feeling like there should be more uh, of a voice to some of the hard facts and potentially how do we get the the hard the 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 scientific truth out across to the social truth sphere right and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do that and i'm trying to observe as that's happening for me so i'm just you know going to disconnect that for a second not actually force that as a, as a question but one of the questions that emerges for me is you know the the financial interests of big media companies which then you know actually are you know influenced by we'd like to think governments but probably even in the interests of the people that actually control you know, and own the media companies potentially and the things that they're invested in, right, um, and their vested interests. And then those are spread as social truths masquerading as hard truths. Yeah, so first off, like, if you're talking about hard truths, then there better be some data somewhere. Mm. And, the, and there should be some papers that are cited or some studies that are cited and for the most part, you know, you should be able to go look at the data and make some sense of it. Like, mm -hmm. you know, the other thing I'll say is that the people that are coming more from like the entertainment or media angle, they, or, or like the conspiracy theory angle, it's like they effectively need to go and um, create like that ongoing sense of fear, mm. right? Because that, that's like the mechanism to keep you enraptured. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that like science isn't exciting. It's definitely exciting to the people that, that do science, mm -hmm. but like it, it doesn't sound like an entertainment product. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it doesn't enrapture you in that way. Like, mm -hmm. honestly, once you've seen the, you know, an initial set of data on a variant and it's been studied by an interesting you know, number of people, or once a vaccine has been deployed to more than 10,000 people, then your N is very high. Like N mm -hmm. just refers to the number of, of study points. Mm. it's like your n is very high and and it's like it starts getting boring after that point like actually doing a hundred thousand yeah your n is higher and it just like gives you two more significant digits oh we mm. were 98.3 percent certain now we're 98.354 percent certain and it's like mm. okay you know so so like it doesn't really feel like that thing that like enraptures you and like really is like gripping you and keeping you on the edge of the seat and tune in tomorrow. Otherwise mm -hmm. you're going to go miss this developing story or whatever. It's just kind of like, that's the data from the latest study. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want to find out more, we are going to conduct a larger study on a larger N and that data will be back in, you know, two more months. So but, you know, it does back then. It right. does require a certain amount of vigilance, right? Um, and actually what it, what's trans, what's well precipitating at my end is actually um, the insidiousness of the relationship between our laziness for having a look at things with a little bit deeper um, towards our propensity for fear and the sort of correlation between those two things. Um, because our, our mind loves stories is how we've, we've learned. And it's easy to hijack our storytelling fear-based mechanisms um, just due to the sheer laziness of us potentially not going looking for the cold hard facts. Yeah, the thing is, is a good, a, a gripping story will basically um, just keep on coming up with new things to grip you. Mm. And so it actually tends not to resolve number one. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and um, you know, it, um, and science actually, like, as we do more studies, then no, things just kind of solidify. Like it, it, it almost always becomes a boring story over time. Mm. It's like, well, now that we studied this 10 different ways, it's just, this is what's up with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the, the, the part of climate change, which is gripping now is just that everything's falling apart. Right. But like the actual data behind climate change, no, that's pretty well established. That's nothing interesting has changed about it, mm. you know, for a while. It's just that now that actual homes are flooding or, you know, huge swaths of forests are on fire. Yeah, we can go cover that as news. That's fine. Mm -hmm. but, it, but it's honestly just a direct extrapolation out of data that we've been looking at for 30 plus years. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's been highly stably boring story actually for a while mm -hmm. yeah so 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 scientific hard fact actually it might you know when you're first studying it, like oh when a virus first breaks out we honestly don't know that much about it does it does it spread through droplets does it spread through aerosols does it spread through you know touching surfaces we haven't done the studies yet mm. 
And it's like, yes, in the first month of a pandemic, in the first two months of the pandemic, we haven't done the studies yet, or the studies are in progress, or the N on the early studies is, was kind of low. Oh, they only tested 200 people or something, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of their health effects. Uh, but yeah, by the time we get to the sixth month, it's like, oh, we found out, yeah, surfaces are less important. It's actually not large droplets. It's more aerosols, you know, given that it's aerosols and here's, you know, like then they, we started getting to these secondary studies around like, okay, how does ventilation in a building, you know, affect it? You know, mm-hmm. how safe is it to do things outdoors versus indoors? And we did studies on that and mm-hmm. then that got kind of boring. So, so the nature of, of science is not to make an exciting story over time. The mm-hmm. nature of science is to start with something that's like kind of unknown and over time, like you have a feel for it mm-hmm. and the feel stabilizes over time. Even if it started very wild, you didn't know whether it's surfaces or not. You didn't know whether to do a mask or not. You didn't know whether, you know, outdoor was safe and indoor wasn't safe or whatever. You didn't know that yet. Mm. Yes. At the beginning and the press covered that breathlessly. So there's this whole interest, interesting intersection between the press and science as well, because that's exciting. That's like nothing, something, you know, uh, the press like breeds off of novelty. Like if things keep mm. changing, and uncertainty. Mm. right. But like in science, it's like, no, we're all kind of in it to eventually make this boring. <laughs> right like we're we're in this that like we eventually <laughs> collected enough data where we're like yep here's the fossil record and here's another trilobite and here's another trilobite i'm not really sure mm. how many trilobites you need to see mm. and you know how many mechanisms we have to age these you know to, to estimate the age of these fo- uh, fossils uh before you're like oh the earth is more than six thousand years old it's like no it's boring now mm. and, and so so like the people that are incentivized to keep on telling you a really good story are maybe not doing science, mm. right? Like that's not really what the resolution vector of science is. Science mm. for better or worse. And, and look, I'm talking about it. It's a boring story, but for scientists, that's a very beautiful achievement. You know, I'm mm-hmm. a physicist. Like it took a long time for, figure, to, for people to figure out the laws of electricity and magnetism. magnetism. Mm-hmm. It took a long time to figure out the, the laws of gravity. It took mm. a long time to start, you know, poking into the atom and starting to understand some of the quantum behavior. And I do think it's like a beautiful arc that we eventually collected enough data to be able to go and, and write equations that like govern and help to describe how a lot of things are going to work. Mm-hmm. Um, and quite consistently over multiple hundred years of practice now, like the mm-hmm. bridges that we build, like, like stand up because the physics works. Mm -hmm. right like you know and you you see this if if the thing is true you can also like really build with it that's why we Mm -hmm. want it to be boring at some point you don't want bridges Mm -hmm. to be exciting you don't want like microchips to work some of the time and not work other times yeah you don't want the medicines that you use to be just like all over the freaking place Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. so like science actually tends to want to eventually make a uh, maybe boring is too harsh a world, a very reliable story, mm, stable, like something, yeah. something that's not changing, something that doesn't have a new chapter to the saga. Conspiracy mm. theories love a new chapter to the saga. Mm. And it's like, mm. you know, who's in on it now? Like, <laughs> what? what are we talking about? Like, yeah. is this ever going to resolve? Of course not. Like you're going to yeah. give up on the, on the TV series. That's that computer conspiracy theory. If there isn't some new saga to it. Mm. And it's like, Yeah. Is the um is the is the place to come home to for the lay person for the lay person tuning into this podcast if we're trying to come home to hard truth is it a matter of utilizing tools such as Google Scholar you know tools out there that actually access us to scientific journals scientific input um, what would be the lay person's access to cold hard facts and I ask from a place where potentially it doesn't even have to be so. Uh, Technical is the word I'm going to run with, because even in the example I used before, I recognized in this conversation, you know, when I was down the conspiracy theory rabbit hole, you know, me coming back to earth, fire, wind and water, it's actually me just grounding into cold, hard facts that's you know it's like you know earth is what the food grows out of what is my relationship with soil you know water is you know the lifeblood of the planet you know what does my relationship with water and it actually was me basically you know bypassing back all the social truths that i couldn't sort of reconcile into the simplicity of what is cold hard true for me and just oh yeah no, no, i love it because actually basically you you stepped out of the miasma of a bunch of people angling to win the social truth game Mm. right because like 
the you know of these truths honestly the social truth one is the funkiest one mm. right like you know if you if there's a personal truth where it's like you know a person knows that they're queer or they like prefer to have spicy food or not spicy food or whatever it just you, it's done there's nothing mm. too complicated about it right mm -hmm. I, I mean society might dislike you right like if you have a very anti-queer society or you live in a place that only makes spicy food they'd be like oh this guy's coming to the <laughs> restaurant again get out of here right? <laughs> but you know what your personal truth is that's my, my mm -hmm. whole point like that's actually yeah. relatively straightforward mm -hmm. scientific truth even though it it does you know it does help to like have some scientific literacy and training and that sort of thing um it actually is relatively straightforward mm. collect data you know uh, identify patterns go and test your hypotheses on those patterns and collect more data to go see if they're true. Mm -hmm. And the more that that happens repeatedly, the more that you can kind of get into the boring side of a thing mm -hmm. where it's like, yeah, that's actually pretty well established. Like 5,000 different teams over the course of 20 years have all tried this and experiment turns out this way. There's less than 1% variance in the results. And that's just what that thing is, mm -hmm. right? The social truth is the funky thing in the middle. Because let's mm -hmm. say, you know, keeping it trivial for a second, let's say you got one set of Madonna fans. It's like, Madonna is the best pop star in history. And mm -hmm. another group of folks is like, no, screw that. Like pop music and Madonna is totally garbage. Like, <laughs> only, like the best person in history is this hip hop artist. And it's like, okay, mm -hmm. I got it. Mm -hmm. And like those people wanting everybody to believe what they believe basically creates a type of... Um, I don't know how else to, to say it other than, well, they, they definitely have some kind of incentive or some type of, of agenda, mm. right? They're, they're just not allowing a bunch of people to hear Madonna and be like, oh, I love it, you know, and ta-da, that's mm. why she's real popular. They're like, no, you can only believe this. Or So I would be a little concerned about folks that say um, you can only believe this on a social truth. That mm. seems weird. Now, mm -hmm. if, if a scientist says, like, you probably should believe this because all the data points in that direction and here's the data, that's mm -hmm. kind of different. And I think that's where people kind of mix it up because, it's like, aren't the scientists telling us what we have to believe? It's like, no, the scientists are collecting a lot of data mm -hmm. and, if you, and they have done a pretty good job of interpreting that data. And mm -hmm. honestly, if they provide if you provided you the same data and you have a little bit of, you know, skills in math and a little bit of skills and being able to understand scientific methodology you probably come to the same conclusions like yes they, they don't need to force you to go and believe the thing mm -hmm. but in a lot of these you know folks that have an agenda around a social truth you know are are transgender people like the downfall of civilization or are they just people that are trying to live their lives and stuff and not be bullied or killed it's like well there's one group of people that are trying to advance the first thing as a social truth mm -hmm. and then there's a bunch of other folks that are like no that's the second thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so when, when you do talk about like, you know, people trying to advance social truths, then you should ask a deeper question, which is for the sake of what, mm. right? Like, are you doing this because uh, you just want to be justified in hating a minority group? Because mm. like, w w for the sake of what, like, let's say you're right. Like for the sake of what are you trying to advance this thing? Mm-hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And like, that's what I would ask of a number of folks that are kind of clearly talking about things that are social truths and seem to have an immovable opinion about it. Mm. It gets pretty insidious with the social truth at times, especially with, you know, the Internet's almost one of the most amazing things in my lifetime, for sure. Um, but also there, there's the echo chamber effect that occurs, right? When you've got social media, it's like I've been searching x x x x y y y y y next minute most of the things that get targeted through cookies and cookies basically mean tracking the things that keep getting fed back to me are x x x y y y y y whereas if you were searching a a a b b b b b the things that get fed back to you are a a a b b b b b right and it's interesting because that enforces what we believe to be our social truth as our personal truth right so um well, at the end of the day, like, you know, you, you can go, that, that's actually a really good thing that you're bringing up, which is if you go and examine a bunch of things that you believe to be your personal truths, mm. and then you ask yourself, well, where did it come from? Mm. 
then a lot of the, if all of your personal truths came because your social group around you just said, you need to believe this, otherwise you're not in our group, yeah. then that's not exactly a personal truth. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, let's say you, you grew up all around folks that were super racist. Mm -hmm. And now because of it, it's like, well, my personal truth is that, you know, people of color are all like, whatever. Mm. They're all lazy. You know, they're all thieves. Mm. They're all whatever stereotype you want to throw out there. Mm. And it's like, is that really your personal truth? Where'd that come from? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, mm. like dad taught me. And it's like, well. Wonder yeah. where dad got that from. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. Yeah. So, so, so it's like, yeah, uh, like to the extent that, you know, uh, and look, when you look at your personal truths, if you were to just list down every possible thing that you believe, like imagine you just take out a sheet of paper and on whatever topic you just wrote down the five things or the 10 things that you believe about it, it actually might be a useful exercise to, to first ask yourself, well, which type of truth is the right resolving truth for this? Mm. Does it make sense for society to decide that all people of color are terrible? Mm. Uh, is that even something that's supposed to be resolved with social truth? Mm. Question one. Question and whatever. Let's say you answer it how you answer it. But then second question is you you say like, well, given that you know like how I'm seeing is the right way to resolve it. Have I been using the right way to resolve the thing then? Mm. Right. Um, and then relative to the ones that you you believe that are your personal truths, you might ask yourself like, well, where did it originally come from? Was that something, you know, I just talked with somebody and that sounded like it made enough sense to me and I just adopted it and never questioned it again? Because like the personal truths that I think that are really, um, that are really defining of your character and defining of you as a person are the ones that you kind of need to struggle or fight for a little bit, mm. right? Yep, yep, That's big time it. because so, I think, so, oh, sorry. Oh yeah, go for it. Well, I was going to actually, as you were sharing, um, I was just reflecting back on my own journey and through my adolescence, I actually had to lose a lot of, this is really hard to acknowledge, but even I had to lose a lot of friends because of the differences in our personal beliefs, but collectively I'd absorbed so many of other people's beliefs and, you know, to the point where one of the things I end up saying in my coaching is like, I actually ended up losing one of my best friends to negativity. His perspective on life was very different to my perspective on life after a while, but we were best friends for so long. Um, and it was, it was really, you know, we groom each other through, especially impressionable stages where we're adolescents, right? But then we end up, like you described, having to sort of stand for, okay, like, and that was quite the tribulation, you know, someone that is literally your confidant your best friend <laughs> and you end up actually having to surrender that relationship to a set of personal truths um yeah yeah and, and look personal truths like sometimes you got to fight for sometimes they just are immutable the reason that i i mentioned kind of you know the the queer person in a conservative family is like mm. everything socially around them said that you're not supposed to be that mm. So like that is both a thing where it's like, no, that's just what is true. I can't mm -hmm. change this one. Heck, I, if I could, I would change it because I would love my parents to love me more. I would love, you know, to be accepted in my church. I would love all these things that, you know, all these people that I'm around that I care about to like care about me in the same way, not to see me as somebody mm -hmm. who's an outsider. And like when you need to go fight for your personal truth in that way and and really in the name of love too, right? Like all the things I'm saying are not because like, oh, I have a personal truth that like all oh, people of color are bad. I'm going to fight you for it. I fought for my personal truth. It's like, I don't know if that's really in the spirit of love right there. Mm. But like most of the people that like need to fight for their personal truths in the spirit of love, then it's like, yeah, that's kind of the, the real deal. That wasn't just a thing that you inherited from the people around you and you never questioned, mm. right? It, it took some effort and ultimately you're doing it because like, you you are really you know both in that case both caring for yourself and then wishing that the world would would uh, be open to you know both receiving love from you and and to be able to uh, receive love from the world. So so I think what will happen when people are trying to to um, you know manipulate a situation is they will in like purposefully bring the wrong kind of resolution 
approach to a, a particular thing mm. where, where like a thing might be a scientific truth and they'll just like grab a bunch of commentators it's like well what do you think about it and of course this mm. person like studied political science or something it's like this is not a client washing person. yeah wow washing right, it away with is, the drama of social truth right exactly so it's like oh well we've well our entire panel of five experts agrees then there is no climate change and i was like oh that's not how this works guys like yeah i mean if this was if you brought five climate scientists on board and they showed the data from their studies and they shared their methodologies and they had an open discussion about which methodologies are more likely to get you know accurate collection of data on this or that i would listen to that mm. but to go just bring on five pundits and you may know this person because they have two hundred thousand followers on instagram it's like that's a very bad qualification to be a scientist <laughs> right I'm just saying like that doesn't sound like how the a qualification <laughs> for a scientist. I'm not saying a scientist can't also have 200,000 uh, followers on Instagram, but that's not how you would go and get a sense to be like, oh, yeah, you know, you know, that's the right thing. Yeah, you know, there are places and it sounds um, very old fashioned, but there are places that just have different incentives. Like in a library, there is a nonfiction section and there's a fiction section. Mm. And they're like not out there to make all that big library money because what is that even, right? Like no one's getting into the library <laughs> business to, to like, you know, buy yachts yeah, and there's, stuff. There's no rap songs about libraries. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's like, you know, it's actually quite nice, right? Like, like people that are incentivized to just, you know, like a library scientist is just incentivized to organize information well so that people can get to it. You know, a scientist is incentivized to do studies that are methodologically sound that could be repeated by other people, mm. right? They're, they're not incentivized to tell great stories that are going to get the most viewers and bring in the most ad dollars and create controversy so it gets the most shares and blah, blah, blah. And to the extent that, that and look, I'm not saying in the modern world that any, you know, person that you might listen to might not have a little bit of blend of both, but you should go and ask yourself, like, is there a primary driver like those, you know, the subscribers and shares and ad dollars and controversy, mm. or is their main thing to actually eventually get toward truth? And honestly, as more time goes on, it just actually sounds more and more boring because mm. like the, the data, you know, just eventually gets established on that. And it's like, well, I think we looked at enough here. So we're just going to talk about a different topic now. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. I love that. Tom, there's a question that's precipitating for me, which is um, there's two parts to this question. Firstly, um, so it almost, almost for the for listening in, it almost feels like, and I'm conscious to say almost very clearly a few times because this may not be the model, and if it's not, then please don't take this away. Um, which is there's our personal truth almost within like a small smaller sphere, followed by the social truth, which is in a bigger concentric circle that sits outside of it followed by the hard truth which is actually you know even in, in an even bigger concentric circle sitting outside of that um is that a good way to, is that an a, a good is that an appropriate way to look at it because and especially why i ask is should they be concentrically living within each other or is are they all three different you know uh aspects of something because the social truth actually does you know convolute between shouldn't be intermediary intermediating between the hard and the personal you know I, I i can see you know um why that is a a plausible model for for this because individuals do live in a society and societies do exist in a physical world that that mm. you know operates by the the laws of of physics biology all that sort of thing um, so yeah, in, in that kind of like literal physical sense, then these kind of concentric circles are true. Um, and actually it points out a, a really interesting thing because we've talked a lot about how social truth is kind of the, the fudgiest one, mm. but like in, in practice, it's like, um, you know, the society that we should eventually get toward is the one where you have the most harmony between these levels. Mm. Right, because if we were to adopt a um, a social truth that around the philosophy of how you build an economy, mm. but it was actually built in such a way that it couldn't work with the the physical truth, the scientific and biological truth of like like how to keep planet Earth livable, 
<laughs> then eventually you 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 have to give up the social truth, right? Because mm. otherwise you're going to extinct, you know, all life on the planet. And yeah. that's actually kind of what's happening here. Like we basically have folks where it's like, well, I studied with the Chicago School of Economics, or I'm a Keynesian, or I'm a whatever, you know, mm -hmm. modern monetary theory, or I'm a, you know, neoliberal, like, uh, you know, uh, like um, economic theory person. And it's like, okay, theories, 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 but like, are any of these compatible with the ecology? Because if they mm -hmm. aren't, then eventually they're going to run out of time, guys. Mm -hmm. Right. And like, those are examples where like, here's the thing about social truth. It is both the fudgiest thing. It is also the thing that swings around the most power mm. and most money, right? Mm. And like this is why they're like everything gets smushed into that fudgy, you it's know, potentially the most influential. Yeah. Right. Now, at the end of the day, though, the scientific truths and the personal truths are actually the ones that last. Mm. Right. You mm. can you can have a complete like, and heck, maybe you don't make the most money on it, but you will ultimately be right if you mm. stick with the scientific truth. Timeless. And it's like, and, you know, there have been multiple waves of economists. And the, this is, I think I mentioned this on the last, you know, conversation as well, but like, the economists call their discipline, the dismal science, but economics is not a science, it's a design discipline, mm. They're like designing how humans interact with each other and attaching like, you know, uh, like, how the rules of money work and how humans interact. Yeah, with we other. spoke about this in the last podcast. Right. <laughs> yeah, you can yeah. literally design it 50 other ways, right? Mm, but yeah. because they basically have pretended that they're a science, then they kind of take themselves a little too seriously. I know I'll get probably a bunch of angry letters about this. <laughs> but, but like, but what, what I'll say is that like, um, honestly, physicists actually can explain the, the physical world and we don't take ourselves that seriously. So economists, mm. just chill out. <laughs> people that actually get really standard results that are replicable which your discipline does not necessarily do like mm -hmm. we don't take it that seriously i think mm -hmm. they actually take it that seriously because their thing doesn't work consistently mm -hmm. anyway because if it works consistently why be so serious about it it's just like uh, even if you don't believe me it's just this is how it is water what it works. is it is what it is and this is, is what how it the is. sun works and you know, just have fusion and the sun works and this is how light gets to the earth it's just i'm just that's just how it works Mm -hmm. So, so like, um, yeah, but like, anyway, like we've seen many waves of economists with their theories and these are effectively like in that, uh, kind of social truth, social layer. truth lens. Yep. And, and yep. like, you know, we have basically seen like cycle after cycle where those economic theories basically do not com comport with the, the laws of nature and the mm. laws of physics and the laws of biology. Mm -hmm. And they basically, because of it, they are actively threatening it. Mm -hmm. So like when, when, you know, um, I think it's Kate Raworth wrote donut economics when she's coming in and basically saying like, oh, we should, you know, rethink economic theory, mm -hmm. but with like a foundational understanding of nature built in there, <clears throat> that like whatever economic laws that we make should not like try to pretend that they supersede physical laws of the universe. Mm -hmm. It sounds real obvious when you hear about it. <laughs> when you put it that way, yeah. But it's yeah. not the way when that When you look at the people... way it is, it's not that way. <laughs> no, like they work on these virtual things like, well, what's the, what's the, um, you know, what's the pricing frontier on the theoretical thing? And like, oh, and, and given that, you know, every company wants to theoretically grow exponentially to infinite, infinity. It's like, yeah, infinite growth on finite planet. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so, and, and I'm over here. It's like, well, there's only just a finite amount of mass in the solar system. And there's a yeah. finite amount of energy that there's comes from the sun. all these asymptotes running around in people's heads. <laughs> so, so it's like, you know, you at least should put a cap there because there's just the sun's not just going to produce a lot more energy for you in a given time period. Yeah. It's just what is what it is. So, so when you hear people like advancing social truths that are not going to comport with physical truths mm. in the in the long run or even mm. in the short run, like there's the whole flat earther, you know, thing where it's like, mm -hmm. oh, I, like if I get enough people to believe that mm -hmm. the earth is flat, then the earth is flat. And it's like, uh, or you could get a telescope and see all the other planets are round. Mm -hmm. And you could be like, oh, well, why would ours be flat and everything else is round? That's mm -hmm. weird. Heck, you could look at the moon with your naked eye and be like, how'd that end up round? Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, so, so, or you could like, you know, for, if you wanted to spend 5,000 bucks, you could buy a, a used weather balloon and just send a GoPro mm. up there and you can see the curvature of the earth from your backyard. If you want, mm. it, it's mm. like, uh, anyway, so like you, you hear about these people that are basically trying to take a scientific truth and import it into being a social truth. Mm. 
mm-hmm. and then try to get all their notoriety, all their money from advancing it as a social truth. You should be a little suspicious of that kind of that. Be wary yeah. of it. Mm-hmm. Even um, and I can understand the challenges in this space because, yeah, like let's just take um, a really easy low hanging fruit to sort of uh, address in this space is like even finance money, right? Like, and we talked about economy, like even the economists potentially, but money is actually a, it's a social truth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but it can have real consequences on you personally and how you interface with the hard reality of life. And I didn't really used to think about it so much until I actually, and this is going to sound for some people that, you know, don't, yeah, I, I shouldn't probably project this on anybody, but I lost my dog um, uh, a few years ago and he was really ill. Um, and the, the my truth in my financial situation then was if I had ten to $20,000, I could have saved him, you know, for a few mm. more years. And I didn't have that financial abundance back then, um, yeah. you know, touch wood. And it was actually really harrowing to sort of just recognize that money could have changed my hard reality and his hard reality. Like he could have been there. Now I loved him to bits and some people don't get pets in that way, which is totally fine. But some people sure. really do. Um, but for me, that was, it was actually kind of a dark time just recognizing that, yeah, like something that is a social truth, you know, it does, like it literally does have some serious cold, hard consequences for oh, us. I'm actually personally. glad that you brought this up because mm-hmm. to the extent that we do have the debate on social truths because you know the nature of social group truth is that it is a little you know fuzzier and all that sort of thing then to the extent that we are having serious discussions on social truth then that's the place where we should be looking at like how do we we create a more beautiful world together Mm. right that's that should be the general direction of why we are debating social truth Mm -hmm. now to the extent that people are debating social truth where it's like well, what if the Negro is intrinsically inferior? And it's like, no, I don't know if that's about making a better world together, guys. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. What, what, you know, what if queer people were sent here by the devil to get, and it's like, I don't know, we're making a more beautiful society like that, mm. guys. It just, it just seems a little off. I mean, mm-hmm. but, so mm-hmm. to the extent that, you know, people are moving things or, and look, there are some things that are social truths. So we already talked about the the weirdness when people are trying to take a personal truth or a scientific truth and smoosh it into the, the social thing as kind of a mechanism to make it fudgy and to debate and influence. But, yeah. But, but to the extent that people are talking about something, so let's say nobody's uh, like a person's not doing that. And they're tra- are trying to talk about a, a social truth in good faith. Well, to the extent that they are kind of having that discussion, you should ask yourself, are they trying to push toward a more beautiful and inclusive world? Mm-hmm. Or are they trying to go push toward the opposite of that? And if they are pushing toward the opposite, you should kind of be like, I don't know, guy, like maybe there's another way to look at this because social truth is fungier. We can decide that, you know, that we could decide that like pets are important enough that like the veterinary industry is a subsidized industry, right? Mm. That's the thing that we could decide. Or we could decide that, you know, pets are important enough that we are really going to go study, you know, the veterinary biology, like it's going to become one of the more popular majors around. And mm-hmm. like the prices of that will go down just because there's more, you know, veterinary doctors that can go make that difference for your pet. Mm-hmm. Now, we, we didn't decide that, you know, we kind of decided like, well, right now animals are worth so much to us. And in fact, we, we go and grow a ton of them in, in, uh, in factory farms and we send them to slaughterhouses. And it's like, yeah, no, then I guess it kind of makes sense that a bunch of the other things ended up the way that they've ended up so far. But once again, that is a a social truth, which is kind of the temporary state of affairs until we think about it a bit differently. Like we, we used to, you know, well, we, we actually killed most of the whales on the planet and like whaling used to be one of the biggest industries on the planet. Right. Mm. But now we're in a spot where no, actually for the large part, like whaling is illegal. Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. that was a social truth that we decided on because we kind of thought no it's actually an uglier world Mm. for us to be out there to go do this so like yes there will be social truths to debate i know those will be more contentious things Mm -hmm. and one should then ask it's like to the extent that people are trying to have this argument they are really pushing for an alternative social truth or you know or like doubling down on a social truth which already exists but is kind of oppressive then you should ask like, well, 
what are they in this for? For the sake of what? Are they, mm. are they trying to make a more beautiful world? Are they trying to make a world where, you know, uh, people are able to go, um, you know, more voices are included and more people have opportunities to live a full life? Or are they trying to make a world where that's just kind of not what's up? Mm. Tom, thank you so much for that. That is such a powerful lens. I have a last area I'd love to explore in this conversation, which is we've got personal, we've got social, we've got the physical. Now, some part of me, just because of my proclivities and my bent and my personal truth, the way I look at the world, does have this curiosity in terms of where does our spiritual truth lie? Is it a sphere potentially beyond the heart? Because, you know, the laws of physics and we're kind of growing into a greater awareness of the mapped world and you know we only know a little bit of almost like the tip of the iceberg of what's really out there or is it something that's connected to our personal truth or is it different for each people uh, each person some people's spirituality is community and it is the social truth for them and some people it is their relationship with the physical is it for us to decide um, each unto their own what are your thoughts and potentially where do you place your spiritual truth in amongst all of this yeah i do have some thoughts about this which is um if you look at all the all the big spiritual traditions, or honestly, all of them mm. in the history of humanity, then there is a lot of overlap, yeah. right? So like when it comes to, you know, things that pretty much every spiritual tradition believes that it's like, everything is connected. Mm. We're all part of something greater, mm. you know, that, that greater thing, you know, has helped, to, right, yeah. has helped to go create the universe as it is and everything beautiful that we've known inside of it, you know, basically are as part of this greater thing. And like, you are going to go see that literally in every, you know, spiritual tradition. Mm. And this is what I call as kind of like the, the universal spiritual core of mm. things. Now, uh, imagine though, that like religion is a specific type of social technology. Mm -hmm. And the, and the spiritual core of religion is just one of the, you know, I kind of imagine it as four passengers in a car. Mm -hmm. The spiritual core of it is just one of the passengers in the car and across all the religions of the world then the spiritual core is actually quite the same same passenger it's like oh mm -hmm. just, we're all connected we're all part of something greater you know your life means something like all these sorts of things it's like oh we kind of all agree with that nice job right mm -hmm. but then there's three other passengers in the car you know for religion one of them is the you know the the one that makes laws and what what i mean about this is for a long time, we didn't have the written word. And a number mm -hmm. of our, our religions like predate like widespread literacy. They definitely mm -hmm. predate the printing press, but they predate mm -hmm. widespread literacy, mm -hmm. right? So it actually meant that religion was not only an important technology to share spirituality, the one the in the car, but we needed to share laws like governance. governance yeah. so that's why it's like, you know, things like an eye for an eye or like, oh, if, you, mm -hmm. if people commit adultery, you stone them to death or whatever. These are basically some old laws. Mm. Right. The, these are laws that might have made sense back in the day, because back in the day, you know, your tribe might be five extended families. And if mm. you have, you know, adultery that basically, you know, uh, encompasses three families out of five, oh, it might actually tear apart your whole tribe. So mm. even though it's extremely brutal to go stone a person to death, you're like, no, oh, that was kind of the best law for the day. Like it was better than having like 80 people in our tribe all fall apart just because three families are now fighting because of adultery. Whoops. We'll just yeah. stone these two people to death. Sorry about that. Now, now look, that's brutal and dumb. It's barbaric, actually, but it's but it makes sense for the, for the right, time. Right. Yeah. That's not the law we should have anymore. But you can yeah. understand why laws like that appeared in these you know religious books because mm -hmm. they didn't have another technology to go pass along ideas mm -hmm. of law. So mm -hmm. one of the other passengers in the thing is, is law. Another passenger in you know the the car that is religion is is metaphysics, which is basically. How did the universe come to be? Why are, why are things physically the way that they are? Mm. So it's like, oh, world was created in six days. And, and or, you know, and maybe I'm pushing too heavy on the Judeo-Christian thing, but it's like, mm. oh, you know, uh, like it's all turtles all the way down, like whatever, you're going to mm. go have some metaphysics here, right? Like mm -hmm. an explanation as to why the world is the way that it is. Mm. And in modern times, Honestly, just science does a better job of it. Mm. Why did this plague of locusts go? Well, God said we did have a plague of locusts. Well, actually, we know now that grasshoppers can basically go into a locust light, you know, you know, a locust state of behavior 
mm-hmm. given these sorts of environmental input conditions. Yeah. Yeah. Science just explains it better than like God's wrath. It's like, no, mm-hmm. no, no. It was just like kind of explains that. Um, and then the, the, the last passenger in the car is a mechanism of propagation. Mm-hmm. And that might be through, you know, go out there and procreate, or it might be, oh, go out there and evangelize and convert, or it might be, you know, go and like launch crusades in order to like convert the people at the, you know, from the, you know, like using the tip of a sword. And it's like, okay. So anyway, all the, all the religions in the world have got at least those four passengers in the car. Mm-hmm. Like, honestly, all the religions in the world basically agree on the spiritual passengers, literally mm-hmm. the same passenger. And that's why I kind of yeah. think that like that one's fine. Like we should just kind of get on the same page and be like, oh, yours says that too. Oh yeah. Mine says that too. Cool. Mm-hmm. Dude, oh, it's just you know, like you call yours Christ consciousness, and mine, I call mine the Tao, and you call yours whatever. It's like, yeah, okay, that's fine. But mm. we just basically agree. Actually, it's kind of the mm. same thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but or Buddha nature, whatever you want to call things, it's like no, that we're just calling it the same. Yeah, you know, we just had different words. It's the same thing. Mm. But then on the other three, we need to go be careful because right? mm. those are the places where the conflicts arise. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, well-meaning people who like believe very strongly in their religions might fight science because they're like, oh, it challenges the metaphysics. It's it needs Mm -hmm. to the world needs to be created in six days. The world needs to be turtles on top of turtles on top of turtles. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, guys, I mean, I think we are a little past that one now. Uh, Or they'll they'll be that literal about the laws, too. They'll be like, well, according to our laws, we cannot ever you know, allow such, you know, this kind of person into our home, or we shall never allow, you know, these two people to marry or whatever. It's like, I don't know, man, you know, like, this sounds like another one of those stone everybody to death things. Like, maybe we're a little past that now. I mean, Mm. I don't know, go look at the laws. Maybe that's still appropriate. (laughs) Like, people want to be stoned to death. But like, (laughs) yeah, yeah, no. Um, yeah. So we just need to be more careful. I'm not saying to just like, you know, that those, you know, ideas didn't appear in those books for any good reason. Mm. Like, yeah, they might have had a good reason, especially at the time of writing might have been freaking fantastic reason to have yeah. those particular things. But just to understand that there's four passengers in the car, that the most important one we all agree on. Mm. And then the other ones, yeah, we got to go make our way as to like, what is the mm. the right way to make sense of, you know, the other passengers in the car based on our our particular spiritual upbringing. And so that, ma- that religious pas- upbringing, yeah, that passenger that we agree on this. I love, thank you so much for unpacking that. That was actually super, super delicious because yeah, just the, the governance, the metaphysics and the evangelization, like the opportunity to sort of, you know, see how that is actually connected a lot to social truth um, in many ways, you know. Um, the My question, I feel... And those are the conflict points, right? Because yeah. the metaphysics was like, you're trying to make a social truth a thing that's a scientific truth, mm, Yeah. right? Yeah. And the, whatever, keep going. No, exactly, exactly. That, and and it's, been, it's really profound to just be able to distill that and sort of go, these are the three passengers actually fall into this realm of truth um, when spirituality is actually a pursuit, some may argue, um, for that universal truth, that unifying factor, that beauty, that love. Um, so question still stands, does, the, does that passenger, in your opinion, where does that land? Does that land, because I know that it's part of me, and this is my personal truth, is it lands within the realm of the personal truth and the hard truth, because the hard truth is consistently growing into that universal truth, if you will. But that's my perspective. And I don't want to make that other people's perspective. So what what are your thoughts on that last pass that that key passenger that is actually uh the passenger we agree on yeah yeah actually what's interesting about it is um we actually are literally all connected Mm. like that is actually a scientific truth too Mm. um yeah and and i actually have a whole ted talk about it and i and and you the the one at afes i did as well which is like the twice as long as the ted talk where i really get into it I basically just lay out, yeah, here's the scientific truth about the spiritual assertion that we're all connected. It's like, no, it's just actually literally true. Here's how. Mm. It's pretty trippy as well, where it's a carbon-based reality and we're all like made of carbon and yeah, it's all made of the same stuff. I I mean, the literal title of the talk is everything is connected. Here's how. Mm. But, But like the, so I think there's a bunch of things in that kind of spiritual truth where it's like, oh, they they actually just happened upon something that is also scientifically true. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And then I do think that there are some elements of the, you know, of the spiritual truth where it's like, oh, your life has meaning where it's like, no, that's actually just a pretty good psychological foundation. Mm, I mean, you could, you, you could, mm. right. You could basically believe that your life doesn't have meaning. Mm. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be a particularly good strategy to exist in the world yeah. for very long, but like, um, but you know, that is an adoptable thought. Um, I won't recommend it. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much for distilling that down. It, it feels, Wow. Yeah, like the the three concentric circles, personal truth, social truth, and uh, scientific truth, and just, yeah, distilling, hey, religion has a lot of other things, you know, that were it's necessary a tools and technology. The and, and those yeah. were the right passengers for most of history before we the had the printing press, yeah. before we had the ability to build off of each other's knowledge in a substantial way. Yep, and you know, all of that supporting our our social truths yeah and then right the, the all of those truth. all of those technologies supported the longevity of the societies that you know adopted the religion so it makes mm. sense yeah and you also mm. make sense why people are so protective of it it's like mm. well it's how it's how our society that's how we got here right <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah so so like absolutely honor and appreciate all the things that got you there but mm. then to the extent that the three other passengers start to like make a ruckus of things <laughs> where it's like Oh, now I'm needing to teach my kids that the earth is only 6,000 years old and they can't, and like they're having fights with their biology teacher or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's like, I don't know. This, yeah. uh, we're missing social, it a little bit now. Yeah. Social truth. Yeah. And I love that, um, yeah, spirituality, the interconnectedness lands squarely in our personal truth and in the hard truth as well. That's just, that's beautiful, man. Tom, <laughs> brother. Thank you so much for this incredible, incredible, incredible distillation. One of the big, big, big things that's been hearkened at today that's really taking away is, you know, I did a podcast with Miriam Williamson and she talked about this conversation around waging peace. And it it feels very appropriate in this conversation for me as well. One of the things I'm taking away is that, you know, it's like waging love um, and, you know, with, with that beauty that you mentioned as well, because, and wage is an interesting word because it has sort of this, this, energy about it but it really feels like that because i can see that you know when it comes to truth and especially social truths it's almost like there is some level of vigilance required um uh, or at least an, an an antidote to our laziness um because we so like it just creeps in like we take other on other people's beliefs just due to sheer laziness of not wanting to look at the cold hard facts or you know trusting someone else at face value and it's not that we shouldn't be trusting but just giving ourselves the permission to sort of have a little bit more vigilance and a bit, like, overcome our laziness just a little bit when it comes to important things such as truth and you know some may argue is there something even more important than truth uh, it's the name of my son actually in sanskrit such means truth so means something to me and this conversation has meant a lot to me as well brother so thank you so much for doing this with us today tom no no problem at all and uh for those tuning in i'll put links to the things that tom has described especially his other talk as well um everything is connected will definitely be in the links as well and uh yeah tom on behalf of myself the inspired evolution community and audience as always wishing you all the best on your journey forward awesome thank you Hey guys, if you enjoyed this video, give it a like, leave us a comment. And if you want to stay in tune for every, the new episodes launching every Monday, hit subscribe and I'll see you in the next video. Stay inspired to evolve.